an indelible mark on all sectors including agriculture, the backbone of the African economy. For the sake of millions of households supported by small-scale farmers, mitigating measures must be rolled out. AATF therefore invites you to an interactive webinar themed Promotion of Agricultural Technologies and Innovations for Agribusiness Resilience in Africa in the Wake of COVID-19. Moderated by Dr. Dennis Chetere, speakers include Professor Hamadi Boga, Dr. Martin Fregene, Dr. Emmanuel Okogbenin, Mr. Justin Rakotoari Saona, Professor Mohamed Khalid, Professor Ruth Onyango, and Mr. Stephen Mushiri. Join our panel of experts on 27th July 2020 at 1400 East Africa time. For more information, visit aatf-africa.org. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good evening, viewers from all over the world watching this show today, this afternoon. Welcome. My name is Nancy Mushiri. Welcome to this webinar, which is the first in a series of various webinars that will be held and run by AATF for the remainder of this year, 2020. This and the other webinars to follow are structured to cover areas of interest that are specific to agricultural transformation for Africa. These conversations will revolve around the smallholder farmer and especially their access to innovative technologies that matter to them and that make a difference to their lives. Today's discussion will focus on the critical aspect of commercialization of technologies. We will be paying special attention to the current COVID-19 situation and the relationship that has with agribusiness specifically. We have speakers and panelists that will make this conversation exciting for us all, but more importantly, that will share information that will be useful and helpful to us all and maybe help us find a way of finding how we can actually make a difference uh, to this situation. Our moderator for this session is Dr. Dennis Chetere, the Executive Director of AATF, who I will be inviting shortly, and who is an agriculturalist with many years behind him. Welcome, Dr. Chetere. Thank you very much, Nase. Welcome, dear friends, colleagues, stakeholders, wherever you're joining us from. In my native tongue, we say, Mwebare. As you have been informed, I'm Dennis Mwesi the Executive Director of AATF, the African Agriculture Technology Foundation, and I will be your moderator in today's discussion. I am happy and honored to welcome you all to this AATF webinar, where we will be dialogue on agribusiness resilience during this uncertain time when the world is struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. In this session, we are joined by some of the greatest minds in the, Afro in the agriculture sector on the continent who are here to share their thoughts on how we can ensure stability and growth in agribusiness in the region, given the current challenge. Before I introduce them, let us have a quick reminder of the issues to discuss today. Okay, as we wait there, today's discussion is promotion of agricultural technologies and innovations for agribusiness resilience in Africa in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, if Munyo can help us, just put up the discussion areas for today. Maybe Dennis, as that is coming on, we can continue with the introductions. Yeah, thank you. In the last 15 years, 
AATF has dedicated itself to empowering the smallholder farmers in Africa with a wide choice of agriculture innovations and strategies to transition into agribusinesses. Although these efforts have helped to improve the incomes and the health of farmers, their families and communities, agribusinesses in Africa remain vulnerable to some threats, such as pests, and diseases, and climate change. The recent emergence of COVID-19 pandemic has further threatened agribusiness survival and farmers' income. In today's webinar, we will discuss the need to promote appropriate agriculture technologies and innovations that will help agribusinesses in Africa to be resilient in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. I will go ahead and introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Professor Hamadi Bonga, who is the Principal Secretary, State Department of Agricultural Research, Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Irrigation in Kenya. He is the former founding principal of Taita Taveta University and was its vice chancellor between 2007 and 2017. He was also a professor in the Department of Botany at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya. We welcome you, Professor Bonga. Thank you very much, Dennis. I'm happy to be here to share our experiences around the agriculture and COVID. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Dr. Martin Fregene, who is a geneticist and agricultural policy expert. He's currently the Director of Agriculture and Agro-Industry at the African Development Bank, working on implementing the Feed Africa strategy that leads the execution of technologies for African agriculture transformation, TAT. And welcome, Dr. Fregene. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitiri. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And we Thank look forward you. to a, an exciting discussion of um, how to make agribusiness in Africa more resilient in the face of COVID-19. Thank you. Incidentally, Dr. Martin Fregene will have to step away in the course of the discussions, but will, will be able to be presented by Dr. Damien Ihendioha. Dr. Ihendioha is the Chief Agro-Industry Officer of the African Development Bank and the coordinator of the bank's flagship in post-harvest losses reduction and agro-processing. He is a renowned agricultural value chain specialist, specializing in post-harvest losses, reduction, and agro-processing of agricultural commodities to diversify foods, enhance their shelf life, and ensure food security. We welcome you, Dr. Ahio Dioa. He will be coming in later on as Manuel steps out. Rather, as Dr. Fregene steps out. Our next presenter is Dr. Emmanuel Okobenin, a world trained scientist in plant breeding, genetics, and genomics, with a focus on cassava, and is currently the director of product development and commercialization at AATF. In this role, Emmanuel identifies opportunities for agricultural technology interventions assesses the feasibility and the probability of success, identifies and sources of appropriate technologies, negotiates the access and development and deployment, and provides overall leadership in the implementation of AATF's project portfolio. Welcome, Dr. Okobenin. Thank you. Our next presenter is Mr. Jack Justin Rakotorisiana. Mr. Jackson Rakotorisiana is the Secretary General of African Seed Trade Association, AFSTA. He formerly was the Seed Production Manager in the Madagascar Ministry of Agriculture, responsible for Seed Producers Associations and Seed Multiplication Centers for production and marketing of high quality seeds. We welcome you, Justin. Yeah. Uh, other panelists include Professor Hamad Karid Othman, 
who is the Executive Director, National Agriculture Extension Research and Liaison Services at Zaria, Nigeria. Professor Mohammed is also an Associate Professor of Agricultural Engineering of Ahmad Beru University, Zaria, where he teaches and supervises undergraduate and postgraduate students. We welcome you, Professor Mohammed. Incidentally, he will be joining in later. Our next panelist is the Honorable Professor Ruth Onyango, who is the founder of Rural Outreach Program Africa, a former member of parliament in the government of Kenya. Professor Onyango also wears different hats and is a recipient of various awards, including the Africa Food Prize in 2017 where she was honored for her relentless efforts to feed the continent at grassroots levels. She is the editor-in-chief of the African Journal of Food, Agriculture, Nutrition, and Development. We welcome you, Professor Onyango. Last thank you. Thank you for having me on board. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Last but not least, we have Mr. Stephen Mushiri, who is the CEO of Afri East African Farmers Federation, EAF, a regional network of national farmer unions, federations, and cooperatives in 10 countries. He has been working in the agricultural sector for 17 years and is driving EAF's 2013-2020 strategic plan, whose focus is entrepreneurship. We will come you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Doc, and I appreciate the, the invite. You're welcome. Now that we have our speakers on board, I would like to highlight some rules of engagement for the webinar. We will have two 15-minute presentations by the African Development Bank and AATF to introduce the subject matter. The panelist session will follow and thereafter, we will take questions from you, the audience. We are all encouraged, you are all encouraged to kindly post your questions on the chat box and we will collect them for response by the panelists. Comments too are so welcome. Now, one thing that is of importance is time management. May I request we stick to the allocated time so that we are able to deliver the messages in time we have. Thank you very much. Okay, now we go to the presenters or presentations. May I now invite Dr. Martin Fregene to speak to us on transforming Africa's agriculture through the fast tracking commercialization of innovative agricultural technologies to enhance resilience. We will come to you, Martin. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Dennis. And um, as I said before, it's a pleasure to be with you all again today. I will ask um, Martin and um, the facilitator to please put up my, my presentation. While Martin is putting on the presentation, I, I'd just like to say that before, no, he should please, please start from slide number one. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, I'll be talking about the African Development Bank's response to the COVID-19 impact on food and nutrition security. And um, next slide, please. And as part of this discussion, I will also, dis I will also describe the African Development Bank investments in, in, in bridging the gap between new agricultural technologies and um, the millions of farmers whose livelihoods depend upon agriculture. As, as we all know, before COVID-19, you had more than 65 million Africans in, 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 in Sahel and West Africa, and also um, in um, the Horn of Africa who are already food insecure. So before COVID-19 even came, we already had a, a big problem with um, supply of, of food. But with COVID-19, now what we have seen is that um, 
there has been a reduction in demand. There has been a aversion in seeing the behavior of consumers, you know, with respect to emphasis on more longer shelf life food and emphasis on less of um, vegetables just because they, are, they, they are not available. And also the disruption also in movement and, the, and lockdowns created also a supply side problem, just a reduction in food supply and, and, and also a reduction in a, in, a, in a food production. Next slide, please. These have, these, these, these have all led to, you know, disruptions in access to food by the most vulnerable. But the African Development Bank had dealt with similar problems in the past. In 2008, you know, we had a food crisis globally where the price of food, you know, it literally doubled in many areas. And what we had done then was um, we've come up with a program to reduce vulnerability and the short supply in um, in, in, in food. So, so we actually had a premise upon which to respond to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons we learned then was that you needed to build, you know, a demand-driven approach. You know, it was, it was, it was important to enhance coordination and support, you know, between, you know, all the different actors to ensure that um, food supply, you know, was increased and also demand either through um, support to vulnerable populations or through support to governments, you know, you know, was in place, especially things like um, introduction of new technologies to raise food production was, you know, was key. Next slide, please. So immediately the COVID-19 struck, the African Development Bank responded with a $10 billion facility that was to support countries, not just with food, but also with health and facilities and health medical supplies. It was also to support countries, you know, with um, budget support to ensure that it, you know, they had liquidity to be able to, you know, address, you know, the, 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 the needs for to pay salaries and the needs also to imp, to like import um, the most important medical supplies. Part of part of the COVID nineteen rapid response facility was also agriculture. Next slide, please. And um, for agriculture, you know, we had three different work streams. You know, we had the immediate. And you know we, we have to respond immediately to the situation in many countries, and, and then we had the more short term, you know, you know, six to twelve months, and then we had the more um, medium term. Next slide, please. On the immediate response, you know, the first one was um, to ensure that food could like, even get to the urban areas where food is consumed. So. We, we had to work with governments to create a green channel that is allow the free flow of um, not just food but also seeds and fertilizers and pesticides and things like that. The second one was also was the provision of um, emergency food relief for for the vulnerable populations, the, the, in the very poor, the urban poor, and also ensure that um, there was labor to continue to till the fields. Yeah. Next slide, please. On the short term, you know, we had to scale up access to improved varieties and sacrifices of improved varieties, but fertilizer and other planting materials for farmers to be able to go back to field. We also had to, you know, support government programs, you know, to, you know, to stock, to, 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 to build up food reserves and see, and at the same time ensure that, um, you know, you know, you know, food was available to populations from, from, from existing food reserves. One of the most important things also was um, to upgrade sanitation and coordinate um, practices, best safe practices, both in the marketplace and also, in, also for production. Next slide, please. But the more long-term, you know, we, we thought about how do we support the SMEs. SMEs produce 60% of the food eaten in Africa. 
And one of the things is, is, is was um, true trade guarantees, you know, and um, first loss guarantees provide improved access for the SMEs to finance. Another thing was also to develop policies, you know, that um, that um, they could rapidly scale up food production, especially high yielded, early maturing, drought tolerance, you know, disease resist, pest resistance, crop and livestock and fish. Next slide, please. These are the, this is a summary of, of, of the priority intervention areas. I have mentioned, you know, the, the immediate, the short, and the, and, the, and, and the medium term, but they were all organized along these areas. Food distribution, establishing of food prices, you know, farm inputs, you know, um, growth and enhancement and resilience support, and food processing. Next slide, please. Others include advisory, you know, on, on safety and, 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 and production, you know, policy support, particularly the green channels for free flow of food and distribution, and also um, setting up operations, food safety tax force. This, this was an initiative of the AU and the FAO to, you know, to ensure that there was a tax force in the, in the government, comp comprised of the government and the private sector, to ensure that um, nobody was um, behind with respect with supply. Next slide, please. This is just a summary. The bank has a, a, a Fed Africa portfolio of about four and a half billion dollars. So we restructured that portfolio, you know, and, and we took about a little bit less than 10% of that portfolio to, to be able to address the immediate needs. You know, as I said before, food supply to the vulnerable, inputs, um, and providing green can the light. Next slide, please. I have mentioned before that um, the, the beneficiaries were one of the most vulnerable groups, you know, the elderly, you know, the children, you know, the poor rural populations um, already affected by drought and locust inventions, small house, smallholder farmers and, and their cooperatives. Next slide, please. But, but this is where I would actually emphasize for the rest of my talk. The bank already knew that Africa was food insecure, not even before COVID-19. So the bank had launched what we call Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation. If you look carefully all around, for example, in Southern Africa, Southern Africa, only 20% of farmers in Southern Africa have access to the new drought-tolerant maize varieties that have been developed in the last 15 years by, by institutions such as AATF, CIMIT, and others. There has always been a huge, a, 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 you know, a huge gap between what is available and what farmers are using on the field. Many of those things, um, many of those factors that prevented farmers from accessing this, this, um, this, this, this new varieties were just the lack of the public extension, because the public extension was what in, 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 in the past and in other countries you know, exposed farmers to these new varieties and also helped to bulk up, very importantly, bulk up the, the seeds of the new varieties to be able to give it to farmers. But but that has not been happening. So the bank stepped in to kind of um, remove that risk for for seed companies by providing the seed companies with um, with um, initial materials to bulk up and also providing them both in in and in and in season post pre in and post season pr production of them. Um, Certified seeds. We have two, 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 two um, major projects. We have what we call Tat for the Savannas, where we look at the the the, the commodities of maize, soybean, and um, and the poultry. They they all together. Because maize and soybean constitute poultry feed. I'm working in Ghana and um, Gabon, Guinea, also um, Zambia. We have been able to, you know, begin production of both maize and, and soybean for the poultry industry. Africa imports a lot of poultry, you know, you know, on a yearly basis. Next slide, please. But, but then we also have the bigger tats and and tats, you know, like I said before, is a platform for for, for technology um, and capacity transfer for of the most um, recent, you know. In, in the most advanced you know, new technologies of heat tolerant wheat varieties of um, 
maize, uh, drought tolerant maize varieties, you know, of um, hybrids and um, sorghum, and as, as you see on the picture on the right, and also of them of them improved rice, you know, high iron beans, orange flesh, sweet potatoes. This was to ensure that the African farmer could increase his productivity. The African farmer could have access to a diverse ba basket of um, high nutrition food, and also the African farmer could have. You know, you know, defensives against the um, pest like the falami worm, and also um, can, can can make the best use of water available. So we had a a, a soil fertility and also water and de um, de um, development um, and enabler compact. Next slide, please. This is this is some of the achievements. This is not everything. For example, in wheat, I'm um, working. Through the leader of the wheat compact in Canada, we have produced more than 64,000 tons of certified seeds. And these are heat tolerant materials that can raise productivity from 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 as low as um, um, three tons or all the way to six tons. And and this has been distributed um, to to farmers in Sudan. Um, more than 300,000 hectares have been covered by these new heat tolerant materials in Ethiopia. About 250,000 hectares have, have also been covered. In, in Sudan and Nigeria, and in, in, in Nigeria, we have been able to export some seeds from from, from, you know, from Sudan to begin the process also of um, expansion of the area covered to to the historical varieties. It's, it's good to mention that this, these varieties were, 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 have been there for the last five years, but there was just the seed companies and the public extension just did not have the capacity to bulk the seeds to make them available to the farmers. That's where the bank stepped in. Also, also we have climate smart maize, where, it, where, where you know there has been a thirty percent yield gain, and this this has been led by AATF, and AATF has done an excellent job, you know, so far. We have been able to um, produce seventeen thousand tons of um, climate smart five seeds for the shipment to farmers. You and have two minutes, three minutes left, Martin. Okay, okay thank you. I'm almost done, and 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 almost um. Um, 700,000 hectares have been cultivated. This, like you know, um, is a difference between farming and, and, and being able to feed for many farming families in Southern Africa and also Eastern Africa, as well as the Horn of Africa. Also, TAT has worked with the government to create an enabling policy so that seeds are widely available. Next slide, please. Well, these are just some, um, some numbers and some KPIs on, on how the COVID-19 response by the bank is um, is to be assessed. I wouldn't go into them because then um, um, you have the presentation and you can always look at them later on. Next slide, please. Yeah, just just mention that then this is a, a collaborative work with the African Union FAO leading the way and also the other regional bodies, you know, Comesa, um, and ECOWAS and, and SADAC and many other people providing very much important needed support. That's yeah, it, it, as I said before, we had worked with our Maria member countries. We did an assessment of, of the current food situation in, in, in each country and based upon that, these interventions were, you know, you know, were rolled out. Next slide, please. Well, um, these are the current countries' situation analysis. I wouldn't go into much of them, but, but, but what we found out was that many of them, you know, actually had a big gap in food reserves, strategic food reserves, and also agrochemicals, and that is where the bank, especially, in, to intervene, you know, you know, um, most. Next slide. This is a, this is one of the last slides. Partnerships, you know, in in, in getting this done, not only for the technologies, but for even the interventions on food supply, on on, on buildings and strategic reserves, is is key. You just have to be able to work with the private sector, work with them, all the all the multilateral, the multilateral development partners. Next slide. And of course, there was an M and E framework to be able to report on what was done. Next slide. In conclusion, yeah, the bank's response to the it, the COVID-19 in the immediate was to build, you know, was to, de was to deploy food to vulnerable populations. In the, in, in the intermediate and, 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 and the medium, in the, in, in the more medium and long term, was to make sure that farmers have the technologies that they need 
must to be able to raise their productivity. And then next slide. I, I'd like to thank you for your for your patience and also for listening to me. And then and then, and then I wish you all a, a, a pleasant rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that informative presentation, Dr. Frigene. And uh, since we will be stepping out a bit, you have given us a lot of information, but just could you elaborate a little bit more on how COVID-19 has affected the bank's vision of transforming agriculture in you know, general? You know, you know, like we all know, one of the biggest impacts of COVID-19 has been on food supply. There was, a, there was a lockdown in many countries immediately after COVID-19, you know, struck. And we, we know that um, many countries, you know, began, uh, that's all rely on, upon imported food, could no longer access imported food. The, the immediate response in many of these countries was, was on an increase in prices. For example, there was a 30% increase in rice, the price of rice in, in um, many countries. There was also lack of access to improved um, 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 and, and high, high nutrition food like vegetables and fruits and things like that. So the first thing the bank did, the very first thing the bank did was to work with governments to ensure there was a free flow of, of this food. And the second thing that the bank did was work with government, provide government's funding to be able to I, I, I identify you know, vulnerable populations and ensure that they are provided food. And this was money that went to the government. So, you know, so government gave us giving budget support to to procure food and also to distribute to the vulnerable. The next thing was make sure that there was access to inputs, very important, access to inputs. So, you know, you know, we had the what I call the farm inputs resilience enhancement support and growth in 23 countries where we work with governments either using um, digital platforms, ICT platforms, or without digital platforms. We work with government to ensure that um, farmers are given a subsidy, very important subsidy for them to be able to acquire seeds and fertilizer and be able to go back to, you know, go back to farming. But like I said before, also making sure that um, improves technologies such as um, heat tolerant and drought tolerant, you know, heat, wheat, heat tolerant wheat and drought tolerant maize were part of the package you've been given to farmers. This was, this was one of the ways that the bank you know, responded. But, but like I said earlier, um, the response is, 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 is still ongoing. We are, we're working with the SMEs who as you all know, we provide most of the food that we eat in Africa. The SMEs are extremely important um, 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 sector in, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in agriculture on, on the continent. So we're trying to improve access to finance, helping governments to be able to ensure that SMEs can get the finance they need and also help them with the, some of the infrastructure, wholesale markets, and some of the roads that these SMEs have to move their products over. Thank you very much, Martin. And if we take note of the priority intervention areas and the strategies are also in the achievements of the TAT program. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Emmanuel Kobenin. And uh, Emmanuel, over to you. We'll be presenting on, we'll be taking us through AATF's presentation on the strategies for enhanced agribusiness resilience in the wake of COVID-19 the AATF experience. Over to you, Emmanuel. This thing is taking time. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Thank you, Dennis, for the um, introduction. And um, um, I would like to join the ATF and my colleagues to uh, welcome those who are joining us um, for this webinar. And um, it's my pleasure to present um, um, this um, important, um, um, to, well, to make this important presentation. Um, um, is dealing on strategies for enhancing agribusiness resilience in the wake of COVID-19. And um, basically, it will also um, um, relate to the first speaker in the sense that um, um, we are trying to address a number of things and ensure that food and we, food and nutrition 
uh, provided to Africans. And also, um, we want people to take note of two key things in this title, the strategies and agribusiness. Of course, COVID-19 um, is the third component, um, which is a global pandemic anyway. So um, just to let you know that agribusiness um, don't just happen by chance. Um, it involves a lot of work, and that is what ATF is devoted uh, to doing to change the agricultural landscape in Africa. And so uh, I will be speaking to um, four item lines, giving you a brief introduction, agribusiness strategies, which is the uh, fulcrum of today's presentation, and um, what is ATF doing? And then a, a conclusion at the end. Um, just to let you know that um, we are talking about agribusiness, um, and that's because we have experience uh, doing this for some years going, and because we believe that um, the trust we need to um, advance agriculture in Africa lies with agribusiness. Um, largely, the continent um, um, thrives on agriculture, so it's largely a farming continent, and um, um, agriculture is driven by the small holder farmers where you have low input and it's basically uh, based on um, subsistence farming. However, um, a lot of developments have happened in Africa. We must um, recognize that and we, we take that um, as, as, a, as a positive. However, um, we still are having difficulties in trying to meet the needs and expectations of the people in Africa. Um, especially the smallholder farmer who teaches the land. And um, agribusiness also is gaining uh, some good traction, but we are still miles away from what we want to see. And basically, um, unique challenges are there in terms of product quality, um, low shelf, and, um, and um, that is not consistent with agribusiness. Poor infrastructure, you don't have storage facilities, means you are losing money. Um, you cannot walk um, outside nature, so that's a problem. And post-harvest losses are there because we haven't got the right approach to solving that. And then um, agricultural finance and insurance are always there. Very important, very important. But having insurance and finance um, doesn't speak to all that you need to do. And just to say you need funds to do a lot of things, but you need to know what you need that funds for. And that is where the strategies are coming up on. And ATF has really worked around that uh, that area. And then, of course, um, we talk of shocks and vulnerabilities. Economic shocks are there. They won't go away. Uh, we have climatic issues, um, which brings um, their bounty components um, much stronger. They won't go um, unless we try to change things. And most of the climatic problems we have are not even from within Africa. They are coming from elsewhere in the world where uh, a number of things are, are happening to change um, um, the climate. And but Africa has to pay for that price anyway. Political challenges are there because uh, policies are, are put in place. A lot of things are put in place and the government comes, that changes. The demographic issues are always there. So those issues really affect agribusiness, but we must feed the people. And that is the facts there. And with those challenges, again, the COVID-19 is here to stay because um, we've not heard that this is something that will go away very soon. And even if it goes away, we can still face more pandemics. And we just must understand that we just have to re-evolve to be able to contend and deal with pandemics and still feed the people. So a lot of things are disrupted. And it's not just in the literal sector alone, but because food is very important and everybody eats food, then it's very, it's very essential and so very important that we address those issues. So we've heard about uh, the markets are not really functioning, supplies are bad, labor shortages because of social distancing, inputs will not be available, border restrictions are still there. And so the, the food production uh, chain is completely disrupted. But again, why are we so focused on agribusiness and agriculture? And it's just because agriculture in Africa goes well beyond food. It goes well beyond food. And so most African countries um, depend on agriculture to uh, employ people. You can see the numbers, the green, uh, 
you know, up to 70% and more in the, in the dark green shades. And that tells you that it's very important um, um, on the continent. And if it's so important, it means therefore that your growth and development in Africa is highly driven by agriculture. And if you place COVID-19 on that, then that makes it a very difficult task to deal with. So agribusiness basically based on the role agriculture plays in Africa is the shortest economic pathway for Africa right now, especially when you look at Agenda 2063. And even if you were to meet the SDGs, you will still need to really um, advance agriculture on the continent. So if we are to do that, what is the best way? We've spoken about money. There have been a lot of uh, government um, interventions in the past. Sometimes farmers get money at ridiculous interest rates. Sometimes they don't get the money. Mm -hmm. And a number of things happen. You have the banks, non-bank financial institutions are there, but at the end, what do they do with that money? Because sometimes they don't get the commensurate response they want and everything is blamed on technologies and um, you know they can't really explain why that is not happening. But ATF has worked around this subject for a while and we now know that the way things have been um, done in Africa does, doesn't just offer the best approach to um, building agricultural transformation. And um, we also need to understand that even in cases where some of the things farmers require are available, it doesn't get to them. And so your money will not solve your needs without strategizing and putting innovation platforms in place. And that's what we've done. So the strategies I shall be speaking with are things ATF has tested, and I will, I will be addressing that. So in addition to that, a great fraction of Africa's demography are not really captured. And you see a lot of youths are not interested. And women, let's say we accept it that they are about 50%, they are not fully integrated or empowered. And therefore, that huge human force is neglected. And that comes at a big cost to Africa. But whatever strategy you use, it has to be systemic and integrated. So if it is not integrated, you will not get a, the synergies you need and good response. So. All the points I've listed there, the input subsidy component systems, deployment of resilient products, mechanization, none of them will run alone. And you need to put them together. You arrange all that into a system and in an integrated manner that will give you the results you desire. So um, in the face of COVID-19, we just have to admit that we must be able to assist the farmers, get some smart agro input subsidy programs that will not distort the markets. We must remember that subsidies will not always be there. And so we must be able to breed, to build um, the, 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 the strong entrepreneurship around the farmers to be able to um, thrive in business when the government is not able to provide funds. But we have a difficult situation right now that means that um, a lot of uh, um, entrepreneurs have been affected, including smallholder farmers, and some small subsidy will be essential to addressing that. We've seen some innovative uh, uh, approaches that have used e-voucher system. It's worked in Malawi, and I know it's worked in Nigeria because Dr. Fregene also was part of his, a program in Nigeria where e-voucher had been used for inputs, and it did work. So we should learn to embrace things that work in Africa in countries and then see how to learn from them. And also, we talk about technologies and inputs as well. Um, Fregene also just spoke about the work in TAT. Climate smart seeds are very important in addressing some of the challenges, climate, um, um, the changes in climate is also um, wrecking on smallholder farmers in Africa. And given the vast agroecologies we have in Africa, we just must have the right technology for the right agroecology. And then um, see how to be building machinery into processes. I will talk about that um, um, in another slide, and which is this. So agricultural mechanization helps you to maximize your technologies very well. There is no need for you when uh, for you to go a small land and use bad technology. Four minutes left, Emmanuel. So um, mechanization is very key. So what I'm trying to say here is that mechanization can be applied in post harvest. It can be applied in pro pro processing. It can be applied in production, and it can also help you with sales as you try to get your mark your your food to the to the markets. Another one is to build in policy. Um, try and see how you can. Uh, putting good regulation for inputs and output markets. 
and then also implement green corridors. For example, Africa is so divided that you couldn't get things from one country to another, including inputs. And so that does not really help. But when you put in green corridors, you are fast tracking the movement of inputs and products across, con across nations, taking synergies of the comparative advantage any country has. And of course, with COVID-19, the government needs to quickly try to uh, bring down the um, infection levels in, in Africa so that the, the business environment can get more confidence to, you know, to, to continue uh, business in the agricultural sector. But one of the key things that has been um, missed in Africa is that we develop technologies, but the technologies do not get to the farmers in the right product level you want them to be. So some of them do face a lot of distortions, no quality, like I mentioned in the introductory sites. That is a very key word because you need to hand over technologies to farmers in the right way that they can use it in a responsible manner. So stewardship is very key. That's a whole big subject on its own. And it's very important to ensure that farmers do have confidence in the technologies you give to them. And then transforming the market systems. You will see on the left, these are the kind of things we have. Basically, it has no rules and farmers cannot even negotiate what they want. And so you don't get good prices there. But when you move into structured market systems, like you have on the right, a lot of things are put in place. For infrastructure gets in there, the, what you lose is not that much because you already put infrastructure to eliminate um, poor quality things and also as, and ensure that um, post harvest losses are minimized. And it comes with branding. It gives you competitive prices. You do packaging, you do processing. Uh, young industrialization takes off and that strengthens the, the, the growth of your economy. And then you minimize losses. So those are the kind of things we want to do in agriculture. And then the seed systems and seed supply is basically informal in Africa. So you give room for um, of professional things to happen and farmers just cannot cope with that and therefore they reuse their, their seeds. If farmers can get good quality seeds, they will go to where they can get it and buy and reuse it. And you know your, your productivity is dependent on seeds, which is also dependent on what the genetics um, sets uh, 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 for, for productivity. So this is very important, but a lot of things are, are needed. Then like now that we have COVID-19, farmers cannot just, you can, you know, now social distancing is the way to go. But this is an opportunity that offers solutions to many problems, issues of productivity, markets, um, you know, extension, you know, financing, a lot of things can be done through this project. And I think it speaks more to COVID-19, even though the opportunity was often great without COVID-19. Right now, things will change. Right now, we are, we, are, we are doing a conference now through a webinar, but that will stay after COVID-19 because um, once people find it as effective, then they will go to it. Then the other thing, which was also spoken to earlier by my speaker, was the issue of partnerships. Public-private partnership is what AETF takes seriously. And it has demonstrated that all through its, um, its uh, um, 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 a business chain to ensure that we build synergies, work together, agree together, make decisions together, create innovation platforms. So you can see there are many players there, it, even more than what I have put here. So if you have to do that, it means that you need to know who you have to work with. So partnership is important. So these are things uh, that are very important and we have demonstrated it in, in the work we do at AATF. AATF is operating in 20 country, 23 countries at the moment and we have several products that have been uh, that have come out from that public-private partnership and uh, they speak to several technologies and uh, one of them is on weed control related to Steiger, maize drought which the last speaker spoke about, insect protection, high productivity and other kinds of stress tolerance. So they are very important and uh, these are very strategic technologies that we have deployed to address some gaps in the, in the, in the, in the, in the value chain in the, in the cultural sector. But I want to tell you, like I said before, agribusiness does not happen by chance. You have to bring it in in the process of your work. We're talking of technology analysis and licensing. We need to see whether there's a component that meets the, the needs of the, of, of the users we are working for and whether it has any business opportunities. And because we're working for business, we subject it to rigorous processes, including testing with users, our stakeholders we work with, and then work together to build up a pipeline for deployment and commercialization processes, and then speaking to stewardship, which I had earlier mentioned um, in, in one slide. And we use different agribusiness models. One of them is a mechanization where we have demonstrated that you gain a lot the power is immense and you can't you can't you can't really quantify it if if you maximize the potential it offers because with more 
um, it gives you more traction in the land area you can cultivate within a short time and your unit cost of production is low and you can really be competitive in the market because you can be very flexible with prices because you gain more you, you gain more uh, 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 power uh, with with the technology and we've used all kinds of things in in this we've used what we call um, revolving fund to help farmers you know we've also clustered them to take advantage of the technology a lot of things uh, uh, you know we did under this um, under this uh, project and we've been able to um, make very strong gains um, um, in mechanization. The cost is much, much lower compared to manual labor that is declining right now. Then we've also moved further to strengthen that, 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 that aspect by creating a social enterprise called AgriDrive. And it's working in three countries with a lot of um, uh, patronage by those we have worked with. And we have had to create this to be able to meet the demands for mechanization in Nigeria. And also another enterprise was done also, which is QBS. QBS, we have issues with seeds. Uh, we are not able to have good foundation seeds that are needed to create certified seeds. And so AATF have worked with investors to be able to address this big gap that is denying many farmers of having access to quality seeds. And then, of course, under the TAT, we've worked with AFDB in terms of developing seed policies for, for, for good seeds accreditation of inputs and building regional harmonization, as well as market policies that will serve uh, as an incentive to farmers who will want them to produce more. And then um, if you, this is one of the uh, key areas where we have made great impacts for all the technologies, we've reached over 3 million farmers uh, with uh, novel, novel technologies that are helping them to address some of the climatic challenges we have, you know, as well as other productivity issues. And you know this is Wema. I remember Wema. Wema did when Wema released those products, and we did some adoption studies. Over sixty percent of farmers were already aware because it was relevant to their needs, and over twenty-six percent adopted Wema products quickly. And we expect that to increase. At twenty-six percent for for a technology that is exceedingly very high. And then also we look at cost and benefit analysis. We've used hybrid rice. Hybrid rice is a technology that's amenable and very friendly with uh, investors in the private sector because they can invest into it and make a lot of money from it. So there's a lot of money in agriculture if we identify the right technologies. And we saw that if uh, um, um, even if you sell your price, your seeds at seven to thirteen dollars, farmers will make a lot of money as, um, from from patronizing such a technology. And then we are using digital tools also um, to um, um, address um, um, needs in the seed industry, in the value chain. Um, there is a lot of drag and time wasting in, in, uh, in approval, certification, inspection. Seed digital tools can be used to address that. So um, in conclusion, we, need to, we, we, want to, we want to say that we need to be called to action. We want to call everybody, the government, all stakeholders, that we need to work together to create, create frameworks to transform Africa into net export of, uh, of food. And we already spent over $35 billion on food in Africa. That's a lot of money. So we want to be a net exporter. We want to move more actors to the top of the value chains for rapid agribusiness transformation. We also want to change or uh, move several ongoing concepts to investment operations. Our concepts of agribusiness, we want them to go into investment operations now because from the work we've done, there have been a very, a very good learning curve that can be put into practice to change Africa. We need to modernize our farming using good technologies. And these are technologies that must show profitability, create investment enabling environment that makes adoption of best practices and agribusiness also profitable. And then um, infrastructure is always very important, especially if we want to deliver uh, technologies, products effectively. And um, and with that, I think uh, I, I will have to say thank you again for listening. I know I showed the time. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel, for that informative presentation. And uh, we take note of the agribusiness outlook in Africa and the strategies for the agriculture de for agribusiness development that you've suggested. Over to you, Mato. We believe that the future of Africa, the future of Africa lies in its vast lies land. in its vast land. We believe the future is in the hands of those who walk the fields. 
for those are the hands that feed nations and ensure a better and more productive Africa. We believe in those hands and that is why we too bring our hands in support of them. Our hands come bearing technologies and solutions that ensure their effort is effort. not in vain. It's not in vain. But deliver results. But deliver results. Results that ensure results that ensure prosperous and food secure Africa. At AATF, we are driving transformation of livelihoods in sub-Saharan Africa through innovative agricultural technologies that deliver results. We promise to deliver prosperity through technology. Okay, uh, just a reminder to our audience, please post your questions on the chat. Now we are going to the panelists and we'll start with the Professor Hamadi Bonga, the Principal Secretary of the State Department of Agriculture Research, Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Irrigation. Professor, what strategies and stroke measures is the government of Kenya putting in place to cushion the agriculture sector players during the COVID-19 period? Over to you, Prof. So you want to share? Thanks. Short term. Martin finish. Thank right. you very much. Uh, that uh, because uh, when the first uh, when the first case was reported in March and plans were underway to lock down Nairobi and Mumbai, we realized that it is going to affect uh, the economy. In a big way, one of the teams uh, to make sure that uh, the country, despite the pandemic, was food secure. So our mandate was to look at, is food available? Is food accessible? Is food affordable? Also, the other mandate was to look at, is production going on? Is processing going on? Is marketing going on, both internally and externally? How are the logistics being affected by this? The flow of food to markets and the flow of inputs to farms. So we set up a food security war room that included the government, the county governments, where most of the action is because agriculture is devolved, and uh, the private sector players and civil society organizations that are acting in areas that we tracked on a daily basis figure out challenges that could impact on the issue of access, availability, and cost. And uh, that way we were able to make sure that the, although despite the lockdowns and the curfews, that actually we, we developed protocols for each part of the value chain to enable the actors to continue with business because we realized we didn't want COVID-19 to turn into a food riot and a food issue. We were tracking the prices, so the prices have remained largely stable. We have made sure markets are largely open. We have had a fantastic uh, season. And right now, we have been tracking our food balance sheet digitally. It's uh, doing very well. We, we, we can say the country is food secure and the sector is doing well. The biggest challenge that we saw was for export markets because the flights stopped and uh, we had to step in through Kenya Airways to try and uh, and uh, support the exporters. It's still very expensive, but there's a stimulus package for that to support them so that they're able to get their produce from the markets. 
but we are already at uh, 2019 levels for, for exports. And uh, I think by and large, things are looking very well for the sector. I know the situation is escalating, but uh, because the numbers are increasing, but the models operandi will not largely change because now people know that food is an essential service, even to fight COVID, even to stand on the roadblock to check people who are violating anything must have eaten. So we have been very busy to make sure that the, the food value chain actors have the protocols and guidelines that enable them to remain active. Thank you very much, Prof, for Dennis. that. Yeah. Okay. To, to what extent has the, the government considered technology in the process of this serious building? Um, of course, we we have been using technology before and after and we will continue the vulnerable so the beneficiaries are and they access the goods through the private sector channel so we keep the market system open so you haven't seen much of government officials moving around in trucks distributing food and i think this gives dignity as well as efficiency and transparency to the processes. We are also about to launch the e-voucher for input distribution to registered farmers. And some farmers are already benefiting through funding from IFAD, but we have funding also from the government of Kenya to this end. So the input distribution that is soil testing, seed, fertilizer, agrochemicals, and other post-harvest technologies Will also be handled through 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 the e-voucher, which is digitally, and uh, because of the challenges of market, we've been having conversations with the agritech companies like Jumia and Trigger to see how to close the last mile. So that they take the food from the farm to their warehouses and direct to the consumer, especially in urban areas. But we are thinking there should be models also for rural areas. So by and large, I see like if youth can embrace this agri-tech space, and instead of the vendor on the side of the street, because uh, using um, uh, digital uh, apps and digital platforms and we were having a conversation with KFW to see whether we can create such platforms working with the youth and uh, trying to support youth to innovate in this space of course learning from the big boys like Trigger Foods and Jumia. Okay thank you very much for those key insights Professor Hamadi. Now let's turn over to Justin Justin, you have been in the seed production business for a long time, and now you are heading the African Seed Trade Association. What new challenges has COVID-19 brought on seed and how is APSTA supporting seed companies to respond? Over to you, Justin. Thank you, Dennis, and uh, hi, everyone, again. Uh, the seed sector, the seed industry is not an exception uh for for the impact of this uh covid 19. uh the first one is as we know the restriction of movement including human movement and seed movement and then the agricultural product movement in general so this for instance uh, reduces the availability of uh, the labor and uh, the cost of uh, seed production has increased as well because uh, the seed company have to share, not to take compete for this uh, available uh, labor. And uh, 
Uh, as you know as well, all related uh, activities uh, to seed such as the seed certification, variety release, they are not done in a, a timely manner because of, again, this uh, uh, restriction of uh, personnel at uh, different stages. Uh, I would like to mention, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, this vegetable seed in Africa, most of them are imported. So uh, the operation at the seaport and uh, at uh, the airport uh, has been slowed down, slowed down as well because of uh, the coronavirus. So imagine if uh, we don't have vegetable seed, we know how important it is for our health. Uh, it will be a big uh, problem for us. And uh, I would say also, you know, in, in general manner, like uh, if the seed company or the uh, uh, seed operator want to go to, to the bank to get money, the opening of the bank is not the same. So uh, I would summarize that uh, the impact of uh, seeds, uh, the COVID-19 on the seed sector has been felt like anywhere in the world. But uh, later on, I will talk about uh, what, we did, what, what did we do uh, to uh, mitigate it. So first of all, uh, we have uh, communicated uh, more than uh, before because the communication is the key for us to uh, know the right uh, information and uh, the right uh, action to take. So uh, at national level, we have the National Seed Trade Association, which are the ambassador of AFTA in their respective countries. So uh, we negotiated, we informed them that uh, this uh, seed, uh, as people are afraid of the uh, coronavirus, we, we say to them that the movement of seed within the country and across borders should not be affected considering the fact that coronavirus have food survivability on surfaces, and it's highly improbable that uh, coronavirus can survive international transport. And this is especially true for shipment on the seed handled by professional seed company that already respect strict uh, sanitary, phytosanitary and hygiene uh, uh, handling protocol. So this is at national level, and uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, in general manner, I would say that uh, the NSTA has been successful because uh, according to the report we got from them, uh, seed has been considered as essential services. So that's a good news. We uh, try to communicate faster, as I said, so we created, for instance, a uh, WhatsApp group. We will use all the uh, uh, communication tool, the website, newsletter, and so on, so we can be informed. We inform each other on real time what is the impact of uh, this uh, COVID-19 in the country where we have uh, National Seed Trade Association. At the regional and continental level, we have negotiated, we have talked to the regional economic community, the trading blocks, to say that uh, please do not restrict the movement of seed and let's do our best to make it even better because uh, I would say that uh, even no COVID-19, the movement uh, across the border movement of seed has been a problem, but now it's time for all of us to make more effort so that it's easier to uh, move uh, seed across border because uh, no single country can survive alone on seed, uh, seed production, we depend uh, on each other. And uh, if uh, the seed movement is not happening, then we will have a, a very difficult time, especially uh, during the time we need. Uh, right now, the preparation for the next season, we really need to, to make an effort to do it. So we talk also about uh, this with the African Union, we have negotiated, we advise them not to uh, restrict the seed movement. So uh, I would say that uh, in general, uh, everybody is aware of this uh, uh, necessary measure so that uh, the seed movement is uh, 
not hinder too much this, but of course, there will be a negative impact, but the extent to which they impact each country depends on how fast they take this action to mitigate the, the, uh, the impact. Uh, this is what I can say for, for now, uh, uh, Dennis, so thanks. Thank you very much, Justin, for that information. I will come back to you later, but let's first continue and we go to Professor Ruson Nyango. Professor Nyango, you are a seasoned agriculturist and the head of the Rural Outreach Program Africa, ROPA. You are also an active, you are so active in the empowerment of women and youth. How has COVID-19 affected women and youth in agriculture during this period? Over to you, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dennis, and thank you for having me on board. And I just want to say jumbo and hello to everyone who is participating. I see many friends I haven't seen physically in a long time, and I'm just happy to be a part of this. You know, I've been very excited about this time. Dennis, uh, I, I realized uh, when COVID uh, was first announced in Kenya, the first thing was uh, for the Kenya government to do like everyone else, you know, uh, close down, stay at home don't move, don't do anything. And I said, I sent out messages. I said, you know what will kill people? It will be hunger, not even COVID. It will be hunger first. And it will be children and, uh, you know, uh, women and families, uh, the poor, the most vulnerable, who are always vulnerable, who are going to suffer most. And I remember going to a supermarket, everybody was clearing the, the shelves, you know. But I, to, I told myself, but the poor don't have a place to keep their food. You know, they don't have anywhere they can keep grains, even if they bought a whole lot of it. They don't even have the money to buy a whole lot of it. But I'm happy, uh, like uh, Professor Boga said, the government very quickly realized that food must move and people have to eat. And this is a corona that is affecting mostly those who are vulnerable, whose immune systems are low. And so that is very critical. So as a, a nutritionist, someone who has uh, concentrated on this issue all my life, I'm happy that even people like you can now talk about nutrition. It's not just food, but it's actually quality food, it's diverse diet, it's uh, more vegetables and fruits that tend to be expensive. They have to move. And my, uh, my, my, my satisfaction right now is that I'm seeing Many young people get into this sector. They are the ones actually now reaching the farmers where farmers are and moving these foods where they are needed Good. and making sure it happens. Well, it happens. That, that whole value chain is, is very critical. The value chain is very critical. And that uh, uh, I, I know that uh, we ho I hope we can come out of this a different people. You know, I hear people saying we need to go back to normal. What normal are we going back to? We can't go back to normal. We have to come out better. And I see this as a silver lining for the African continent. We are the agricultural continent. We are the continent that really toils on the soil. And we need to see now how our people who toil on the soil, those women, young people, but also men now, they are realizing that the soil is where Africa's wealth is. And we can also go back to our traditional foods because those imports, people don't even want those imports anymore because they are saying, but are they really healthy? So we know that people are protecting themselves using foods, herbs, fruits that they find within the environment and also spending more time with children but let me finish there, Dennis. I can tell you that many children all over the world are at home. Many parents are not in Kenya, are not used to having children at home. Children are at school with the teachers. Or for the middle-income children are with the ayahs. So for some situations, yes, parents are bonding. But in some situations, children are really in trouble. And when children are at home, they eat a lot more. So it's very costly for the parents. So Professor Boga did not mention about the 1 million kitchen gardens that the Kenya government is promoting 
to make sure that families have a diverse diet. So I'm happy that finally, finally, is quality food. Finally, we can open up markets. Finally, we have to make sure that those who produce actually benefit. And as COVID will show us, we don't put enough resources to the producers of food. You know that, even the donors, when they give us money, that money does not reach where I work mostly with smallholder farmers on the ground. We are now talking for about opportunities for young people. Those young people need those resources and Africa Development Bank, with all the, a lot of money you are talking about, we need to see those resources reach where they are supposed to reach, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Let me leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor Nyango, for those insights. And uh, I see uh, Professor Mohamed Karidri Osman has joined us. You're welcome, Prof. Now, the question, the next question is up is to you. You work in the government extension services. How has the pandemic affected extension services? Over to you, Prof. I think you are muted. We are not hearing what you are saying. We are not getting what you're saying. Mato, can you come in? Colleagues, it seems there is something uh, wrong with this, the microphone. Uh, Osman, let's go to Mr. Stephen Mushiri. Mr. Steve, uh, Mushiri, as the head of East African Farmers Association, you work closely with the farmers and understand their needs and challenges. What action are you taking to reduce the effect of COVID-19? First, as an organization, the Farmers Voice. Second, with farmers and all with stakeholders. Over to you, Mshiri, please. Yes, thank you, uh, David. Uh, sorry, thank you, Dr. Chetere. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that um, uh, I think this COVID uh, situation has really uh, caused a lot of disruption uh, in as far as uh, production at the farmer level is actually concerned. And some of the things that we're actually doing is that, uh, one, uh, we've, we've, we've undertaken a huge consultation with our members just to understand the operations. And, and if the issues are really varied from you know, late plantings, access to finance, um, you know, some of our corporate have, have actually even gone bust in terms of financial distress. Uh, and uh, of course, there have been disruptions uh, in the off with respect to access to markets uh, in countries where we've had challenges uh, of movement restriction. So some of the things that we, we are doing is that, uh, or one of those we quickly try to mitigate that, uh, is that uh, we try to work around, uh, uh, try to coordinate to ensure that uh, plantings were actually achieved. I think uh, at the onset, we had done about 60% uh, achievement. But with time, I think with late plantings, um, you know, we've, we've been able to almost close that gap uh, so far. And I think as late as about a month ago, we were coordinating delivery of top dress. So some of the things we've done is that uh, we've, we have an e-platform. It's called e-granary that uh, has been operating in Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Rwanda. And uh, we've been linking farmers all the way from, you know, inputs, service delivery in terms of finances, 
uh, and, and, and off, off tech, uh, uh, you know, supplying through contractual arrangements and the logistics around that. Of course, that had helped a lot uh, because the idea was to enhance uh, decision making uh, uh, so that then farmers are able, so that then we're able to interact with other partners along the value chain to be able to deliver uh, because of bulk procurement, economies of scale, uh, you know, affordable inputs, um, affordable finance, uh, affordable credit, but also, you know, to reduce the cost of aggregation. Uh, and therefore, the logistics of, of lifting of lifting that, of course, that of course also got quite disrupted. Um, so, some of the immediate things that we are doing is that uh, part of the consultation we have uh, provided that information or report to uh, some of our partners, and uh, we are actually in the process of uh, accessing some resources uh, around uh, COVID. Uh, we've also been able to review some of our project activities to try and adapt them. Uh, to the current challenges, of course, like I said, um, uh, some of the gaps are quite huge. Uh, some of that that financing will be used to uh, some of that financing will be used to uh, uh, close some of those gaps. Some of them include uh, financial distress, you know, uh, hiring of uh, of uh, hiring of storage facilities, paying of uh, uh, logistics, uh, and so on. We're also trying to create a lot of awareness to our members, so the funds will be used to develop a lot of print material. I think, like you know, governments have uh, governments have have developed you know policies around COVID, but I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to domesticate those, especially to the farmers, to unpack those uh, and make them relevant to you know their everyday operations, whether it's at the aggregation center, uh, whether it's um, you know in the fields, and so forth. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do is uh, some of the monies will be used to procure some PPE material for the farmers. I think at the onset we had even farmers being arrested for not wearing nose masks and stuff like that. So we are trying to see, you know, how can we help, you know, our offices at the national level and maybe some of the field staff so that, um, uh, you know, they are able to go on with the operations undeterred. The other thing we've done is uh, to invest uh, on E-tools. You know, just last week, uh, we were able to do a board meeting, we were able to do uh, an annual delegates meeting, uh, and uh, we are seeing that uh, we have to use those platforms even to to provide oversight in some of the programs, Meet have, have meetings with fields, field staff, uh, but also in terms of extension. Uh, one of the things we are doing uh, on our e granary is that uh, we try to really expand uh, uh, the platform. Initially, we are providing mainly SMS uh, support, uh, but now we are providing voice uh, 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 messages to our farmers. And uh, what we're getting as feedback from the field is that uh, we're getting a lot of pictorial, um, you know, uh, pictorial, you're collecting a lot of pictorial, um, um, what do you call them? And as part of extension, pictorial reports, you know, just, just trying to monitor, you know, how the crop is actually looking like uh, and so forth. So um, I think for us, um, I think that's the immediate uh, stuff that we're actually doing with respect to trying to mitigate, um, you know, at a short term uh, basis, uh, the impact of COVID. Thank you very I much, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate for that uh, insight information about your activities. Uh, do we have Professor Osman back yet? Or Okay, since Professor Os uh, Osman is not yet back, uh, I want to thank very much all the panelists for the insight contribution you have given us. Now we are going to turn questions from the audience. Can you continue sending in your questions through the chat and I will share them with the panel members. I see, uh, it's said we cannot get him. Okay, we have received a number of questions, but we will just continue sending them and we will see how we share them with, with you afterwards. Uh, the first one we have is from Gregory Sikumba to AFDB and AATF. And I hope Dr. Ahendioha Ahen, Ahen is, uh, is with us already. And the question is, what opportunities are available from AFDB and AATF stroke CGR on this 
spirit of public private partnership to support the private sector in supporting digitization of research and on farm management during the COVID 19 pandemic. Over to you, Dr. Ahendia. Ahendia, what's sorry? Is Emmanuel, can you address that then? Seems we are not getting uh, Damien. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah. Um, we've been helping um, the private sector on um, on a number of things, um, especially um, around um, the seed systems, um, principally. And um, for the seeds, um, we've looked at the possibility of trying to help them around um, um, a platform AATF is involved in. I mentioned it called the Seed Assure platform. Uh, we very much want like to see how we can strengthen them in terms of um, um, the quality of seeds they, they, they produce. Oftentimes, um, the certification process can be a bit cumbersome, and we're trying to see how they can get the certification done quickly. And even things around, even when they when they use the uh, art growers, we want to know what the art growers are doing through seed inspection, and then um, try to see also how do seeds move around. So through that digital platform, a lot of things can be done quickly, and then um, to guide them um, the number of uh, things even. Uh, across the borders. And of course, you know also, like I mentioned, we work around policies. So those things are um, to facilitate um, a holistic approach towards an improved uh, seed system. So um, in that respect, um, digitization is very important and including um, normal um, governance issues, um, just to ensure that we, they are not bogged down by too much bureaucracy and, and to bring speed to, um, to ways things are done. So uh, basically, um, AATF is involved in that line. And um, um, we in AATF right now are trying to see how we can extend uh, uh, digital tools, um, not just only within the seed systems, but also around markets. We have in-house um, platforms um, which we use, uh, guide farmers, like for example, on mechanization. Um, um, we are also trying to um, apply it also in the use of implements on the field we're trying to also um using uh, we're also trying to use it to link um some of our um, um, uh, um stakeholders to the markets a number of things and in the in the in the in the product in the productivity zone um there are many concerns there on how you can add value um to the work you do on the field um in terms of um um, the use of inputs. Um, we've seen uh, inputs, um, sometimes they are not well maximized on the field, they are wasted. We want to bring in tools that will help farmers to um, bring variable application of inputs on the field in response to um, the soil fertility um, 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 gradients on the field. We also want to see how they you know, manage resources effectively. You know, a lot of things we take for granted, they are the cost like even, even water. If we were to do irrigated rice uh, farming, you need water and water is resource. So all those things are areas we want to go to. So there are huge opportunities. And like I said, they need money, but you need to see where you get value for money. So those are areas AATF Thank is Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank uh, you. Before we go for more questions, uh, uh, Professor Mohammed is back. Over to you, Professor, please. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm back also, African Development Bank. Thank you. Oh. So can you compliment on that question which was asked since it was addressed to FDB and the ATF? And the question is, uh, what opportunities are available from African Development Bank and the ATF stock CGR in the spirit of public-private partnerships to support the private sector and supporting digitization of research and on-farm management during the COVID-19 pandemic? Over to you, Damien. Uh, 
Mm. We are not we listening. We are not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Uh, I said thank you very, very much. And um, it is a great pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar. And I thank the organizers and uh, Emmanuel Okobeni, my former colleague, for his responses. Uh, from the bank side, uh, a couple of things are at play. We know that um, the SMEs have not been fully taken on board. And most of uh, the food we eat in our clients, in our communities, in our families, are products from the SMEs. So the bank has realized the important role that SMEs play. And uh, we are trying to develop instruments to network uh, SMEs into our operations. And the surest way to get the PPPs is when you find a, a solution to reintegrate the SMEs. Whereas the bank has, is trying to develop the SMEs framework, what we've done now is um, using the projects we have on ground to find a way to support the SMEs so that uh, they can, we can gain traction from what they're doing with the support of uh, some of the operations we have in countries. I know also that um, input is a very, very key factor in addressing the COVID issue. In the past, distribution of input is domiciled within government. And we have found out that uh, government cannot do so much in that realm, for which we have uh, invited and indeed involved the seed companies and some private entities that have spread that we can assure that they will send their quality inputs. Because the challenge also is that um, most times you expect uh, most of the private entities to help in distributing input in the name of PPP. But the quality of what you get from some of them sometimes will be a far cry from what we expect. They mix uh, grants with seeds and seeds with grants. And then what comes to farmers also becomes uh, a challenge. So that is an aspect of what we're trying to do as well. In terms of uh, processing, we know that a lot of food is being processed and then they can remain at that local areas of production if value is not added on them. And if we don't have the mechanism to process them, to feed the people, uh, malnutrition will become still very perverse within our climes. So we have uh, developed through our nutrition department some family and community food processing methods that uh, we involve women in those training, in those formulation, because quality is also an issue. If you give them those um, uh, trainings and then you don't infuse uh, quality and safety of those foods that uh, they produce, it can be a challenge in terms of public uh, health uh, problem. So that is also what uh, the, the bank is uh, doing with respect to involving many more people in what uh, we are doing. Something that is emerging also is the fact that um, awareness raising with respect to uh, people that get information across board and across uh, various stakeholders is a missing gap in the hope that our extension systems have crumbled in most of uh, our countries. And without uh, extension and without getting the knowledge base in the hands of those who require them and who need them, that knowledge is lost. So what we are trying in as, in as much as um, we are trying to look at the broader situation is uh, to look at uh, private uh, sector extension delivery systems that have worked 
and have uh, that have reached within countries to make use of them to reach to as many stakeholders and farmers as possible whereas in the long term we are hoping to uh, bring back the extension systems that have uh, almost gone moribund in most uh, of uh, our countries i think um yeah, we have a minute the bank okay thank you very much so we have uh, some of uh, these uh, programs uh, we are running even across the uh, borders and countries and regional member countries we are also trying to find the uh, private sector entities whose activities crisscross within a border within a regional grouping to involve them in input distribution and the provision of goods and services so that uh, we they can reach areas of need for those uh, services and uh, goods i think in a nutshell this is uh, what uh, the bank is doing in area of promoting ppp across board within this context within some certain situation of covid we have found ourselves thank you very much thank you very much dr ahendi yoha and thanks for that contribution now we are going to get a brief from professor mohammed over to you professor mohammed Oh, the question was how was how how has the pandemic affected extension services? Since, uh, as a person who is working with the government extension services, oh no. <laughs> Prof, we are not uh, getting you again. As we wait, we can have another question, which is from Dr. Ruse Ngare to Professor Boga. Is there an initiative to register good business practitioners so that in the case of future lockdowns, they can be classified as essential service providers? Over to you, Professor Boga. Mm, I think there are so many initiatives that we are trying to consolidate. Uh, so that we we use it for various purposes in the ministry. We are calling it registering the value chain actors. So this is under the Agriculture Sector Development Support Program, which is funded by CEDA and is operating across the 47 counties. And uh, it is key for gathering information about value chain actors but also our organizations like the Agricultural Food Authority was collecting registration information to enable especially those who are dealing with food to be treated as essential service providers, to have them with stickers. But all of it was happening. We haven't had time to sit around and make sense of it and see how to, to apply it in future. But I think more and more we'll be moving into this uh, digital space, we have a consultant working on all these forms of registration, whether of farmers or, or of other value chain actors, so that uh, we can streamline and uh, make our interactions more efficient and more predictable. Thank you very much, Professor Bonga. Uh, we have another question, which is from Monica Ndoria to Stephen Mushiri. Have farmers in East Africa experienced hiccups in accessing certified seeds? Over to you, Stephen. Yes, um, thank you very much. I think uh, that has been an ongoing challenge uh, in this region. Uh, I know some of the countries in East Africa have even bigger challenges when it comes to access to certified, uh, not just seeds, even fertilizers uh, and pesticides, and it's such a big problem. And uh, with our e-granary platform, that was, that's one of the things we were trying to, uh, to, to, to close. You know, where, for example, uh, because we build an ecosystem of partners, we're able to ensure that uh, whatever seeds farmers are accessing is actually certified. Uh, so that then in case there's a challenge in terms of maybe germination or otherwise, then they have a, a route through which, you know, they can present that grievance 
and it's incumbent then upon us to be able to follow that up with the seed uh, uh, seed produce. And we have done that. I mean, we had challenges, for example, with maize in one region where we had uh, you know major problems, and the farmers were actually uh, co compensated. I think with respect to COVID, uh, it, it was a bigger problem because uh, it was compounded by the fact that uh, uh, you know even finance became even a bigger challenge. I think uh, because of COVID, now agriculture became even more risky uh, as far as the financial institutions are concerned. So, so that coupled with logistical issues, uh, we had quite a number of farmers not being able to access uh, seed. I know in Uganda. Our national farm organization was able to partner through government to help in terms of uh, even seed distribution, fertilizer distribution, and so forth and so on. So it's still a major concern uh, in this region uh, in terms of adulterated uh, inputs. And I think it's good uh, our colleague from this uh, seed trade association is here and government officials are here. But it's still a big problem. And um, we need to look, look for concerted ways of, uh, of dealing with it. And we can only deal with it if we have a value chain approach where everybody is seen to be uh, inclusive with respect to the value chain. We have to work with everybody. So that when an issue is raised, then it's circulated to the rest uh, of the value chain actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, now, colleagues, we are soon coming to an end, but before we leave, may I extend one final minute to each of our finalists today to give a parting shot as we wind down. And I will start with Professor Boga. Yeah, I think the, the COVID challenge uh, presents another opportunity also for Africa to learn out of this crisis, to develop its uh, scientific capabilities. Even as we struggle with the agri technologies. Uh, I know the agri-technologies, especially biotech, are not very far removed from uh, synthetic biology, which is needed, for example, to, uh, to, to do the diagnostics and other interventions that are needed in the public health sector. I think the, the challenge before us is to look at the human resources that are available. Uh, in the continent as far as technologies around the, 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 the synthetic biology area is concerned and the equipment and the infrastructure that is available and see whether we can use this opportunity to grow the capability, scientific capability to respond uh, to this crisis in all its dimensions. I think we have been very responsive, maybe worried about about PPEs, mostly worried about whether we have the test reagents, and we haven't been thinking very much about how to develop the capability to have all those items grow locally. But this problem is not going away, and I think the next big disease will still be viral, just like the one before that HIV was viral, and the one of uh, Ebola is still viral. And even the plant ones are viral, and the science is the same. The DNA is the same. I think we really need issues with culture and fear them. The more we will be consumers of this technology, because the and so that is the kind of conversation I would like to put. Okay, thank you very much for that so choosing the meeting. We have lost a number of times. Over to Professor Ruth. You are parting short as we wind down. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I, I've really enjoyed this. and um, Thank you so much for putting this on. I, I, I think that uh, uh, we have to look at silver linings in this. You know, every emergency, every tragedy has a silver lining. And the silver lining is that uh, as Africa, what, what can we learn from this? What do we have to offer ourselves? How can we uh, trade better with each other? And how can we 
uh, trade outside? You know, what do we get out of Africa to the rest of the world that is truly African? I think those are opportunities for us, including our own foods, our own foods, which are very healthy, which we have forgotten. We are going back to them, and that is important. And secondly, and lastly, I think our universities, right now, you know, they are sitting back, waiting to reopen, to go back to the same programs they have had always. You know, it can't be, you know, what is the relevance of university education right now? You know, it, it, we have to be manufacturing things. We have to be making things. They have to be of quality, you know, let's share. And uh, I think we need to look out at our curricula right now and see whether they are relevant or not. And then, uh, uh, and really, let's, let's see how we can produce healthy foods, vegetables, fruits, even where we sit in the, in the city, even in our own houses, in our own little apartments, we can grow better food. And I believe that uh, by the end of COVID, if it ever ends, we shall be better people. You know, if, if it ever ends, it may not end. But, uh, and, and then cleanliness, you know, hygiene. By the way, more fewer people are visiting hospitals now and it's showing us most illnesses have been food and water related. So I hope we don't go back to being dirty you know, and making our foods toxic, but we can be cleaner and more hygienic because even food needs to be safe and it needs to be good to make us healthy. But thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot and everyone. So, Kwaheri, <laughs> bye-bye. Thanks, Professor Ruth. <laughs> Over to you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ahindioha. You are parting short on, on behalf of AFDB. Yeah. Um, three quick and short uh, parting shots. Number one, partnership and collaboration is key in what we are doing in this uh, situation. There is little, nothing we can do at the individual level. Indeed, to note the strength of a, a broom, if you pick one stick, you can easily break it. But if you take it as a bunch, it's difficult to break it. So coalizing our efforts and having this collaboration and partnership to deliver the country level is key. Number two, we need to simplify our procurement uh, processes and use the uh, UN agencies, FAO, WFP, that can quickly implement and whose movements within countries because of their status can enable them do something quickly on the ground. And uh, lastly, we think that this uh, epidemic is a public health issue, but it is more of a, health, of a food and nutrition issue. So I think it is left for us to amplify this dimension that beyond the health issue, you need to leave for the next day. And indeed, whatever drug you are given, they will tell you eat before you take it. So the need for amplification of this pandemic, more as a food and nutrition security problem, more than a health problem, because governments, tend to spend more and tend to amplify the health issue and less of the food security issue. So this is something we need to put in the public glare as a way forward in resolving this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for those three parting shots. May I call upon uh, Justin, please? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dennis. Uh, I would say uh, the COVID, COVID, coronavirus is here, so let's, uh, let's us face it. Uh, it has a negative effect on the activity of seed companies and accordingly those of farmers. Uh, we would like to reiterate our call upon the seed regulators, the government, to continue facilitating the seed movement and to the seed company. Let us please continue uh, our professionalism in handling seeds. So uh, it's time to strengthen our solidarity to move together 
so that uh, our agriculture uh, in Africa will still be able to feed our people and uh, we know how important is agriculture. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Justin. Over to you, uh, Stephen. Yes, thank you, uh, Dennis. Three points. One, um, more than ever, we need to digitize agriculture. And I think um, uh, I think has been raised by a number of uh, presenters. We need to look at all actors and see how we can actually digitize, but most importantly, how we can actually converge uh, around the kind of data we'll be uh, collecting and generating. The second thing is, uh, and this lesson from COVID, we need to diversify uh, and uh, we need to stop. I think one of the challenges that we've had and that is facing this region is that we have very low storage capacity, uh, very insignificant, and it is not diverse. So we need to look at how we can store and preserve you know, vegetables, milk, livestock products, uh, and so forth. So that We have lost you or so. Sorry. So the third thing is that um, um, the climate events are now more frequent than ever. And I think when you have a, you have climate events that are regular and you have a shock like, uh, like, like what you have, you know, of COVID, uh, the, the people who bear the biggest brand are actually farmers. And I think it's important that uh, we think of, a, of prob probably putting together some aggregate emergency fund. You can imagine with the impact of COVID, and I talked about some of the consultations we did, some of our cooperatives are in dire financial distress, and they actually need uh, some kind of just support to take them back to the normal operations. And this is not going to be done by banks. Banks are not going to offer that support. Uh, we really need to think of how we can have such a fund for especially farmers. And I think once they're registered through these platforms, you can actually be able to access them. And the last and final one, uh, which I think has been talked about by Professor Ruth, is the issue of trade. And, and I think even just as I talk, Justin has talked about it, we have the ACFTA. Uh, I think we need to think about how to feed ourselves as, as a continent, as a region and as a continent. Uh, I don't want to belabor on that. I think we all know what the AC, ACFTA is all about. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Stephen. Is the Professor Mohammed able to talk at the moment? At least putting, you are putting short. It seems we are still having the same problem. We are not hearing you at all. Okay, over to you, Emmanuel. You are putting short. Yeah, well, just to say that um, uh, you know, just to reiterate that uh, agriculture is a big business, and um, if you give it what it deserves, it comes out well as a business. And that um, the, the the destiny of many Africans um, lie with Africans, including the leadership um, in Africa. Um, it's very important that the government creates um, the right environment for the smallholder farmers um, to transform from subsistence to a real commercial agriculture. Your commercial agriculture should not be determined by the size of your land. It's about doing the best things in whatever size of the land you have. And then you shall you will now get um, 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 a transformative outputs um, from such lands, which can also give you the incentive to continue to expand. The second thing is that um, we should not be wary of technologies because technologies are what is driving um, agriculture. And, and the business in itself. Because if you use inferior technology, you will not be able to compete in the world market. And as globalization um, has been um, created, it's not going to go away um, anymore. So Africa must be willing to uh, compete in the international markets. And when I mention technology, um, let's move away from controversies around biotechnology. The world is moving with biotechnology. Biotechnology is a big field. Um, let Africa key in early enough, otherwise we shall be left behind. And just to say finally that you will not maximize business if you don't add value 
to what you grow. Um, many people grow crops and they sell it in the raw state. Now, the processor makes more money because he runs away with your raw product. So if you produce your raw product from the farm or produce, add value to it and make more money. So as you move in the value chain, up in the value chain, you make more money. So that's just the message to uh, those who are in agriculture and 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 just to reaffirm re again that um, whether it's about health, whether it's about livelihood, whether it's about education for your children, agriculture can offer that. And the best ways to embrace technology, embrace innovation platforms, and be well-focused. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the webinar. It's my hope that you benefited from the discussion as much as I did. On behalf of ATF and the entire production team, may I extend a very hearty appreciation to all the speakers for gracing our first webinar and sharing with us their findings and opinions today. Thank you very much to you, the audience, for your presence and the consistent engagement throughout the webinar, and we look forward to joining us in the next webinar. As I began in my native Rudu tongue, I end in the same Mwebare. To me, thank you all. <laughs> Over to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and thank you for effectively mod moderating this first session. We appreciate that. We cannot thank enough our, our viewers enough for spending just over 90 minutes with us. Thank you very, very much. A lot has been said, a lot has been summarized, so I'll not go into that because we received a lot of good advice, great advice, and a great number of stories can come out of just what we listened to. Uh, key from what I heard is that food and agriculture is central uh, to fighting or dealing with any pandemic of any type. And our wealth as Africans is on our soil. So we need to go back uh, and do uh, the best we can there. And the most important that I heard today is there is no normal that we are going back to. We need to come out better uh, than COVID found us. Now, our next uh, webinar will be announced shortly and most likely it will be on mechanization. And we do hope that uh, we will uh, see you there uh, during uh, that uh, uh, webinar. For now, let me also sign off and say thank you very much and kwaheri yakuanana. Thank you. <laughs>